Hey everybody, how's it going? Happy Friday. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simi. As always, and we're going to keep it short and sweet today uh, because last night we were subjected to a really, really bad England performance, weren't we? And the fallout from that has been quite severe, I would say, despite the fact that England are pretty much through to the round of 16 anyway, just looking at some of the and listening to some of the discourse off the back of that, I, I found it quite draining, to be honest with you. Uh, we're going to touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, I know we did it yesterday, but I kind of I, I put the pod out yesterday where I talked about Declan Rice and I talked about the fact that I didn't really think he had a good game. But at the same time, I felt like the system wasn't helping him. I felt like the fact that he's got a fullback, essentially, playing alongside him didn't help him either. And you would not believe the criticism I got on social media overnight from Liverpool fans going, why are you scapegoating our player? What about your player? He didn't even improve after the change was made. And Trent Alexander-Arnold was taken off and a proper midfielder in Conor Gallagher came on, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to touch on that really, really briefly. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, somebody who's potentially leaving Arsenal Football Club, as well as then somebody who a lot of us would hope uh, to see come in through the door this summer, if, of course, a deal can be done. It's very easy to kind of watch these international tournaments gravitate towards an individual player and think they're the solution, they're the answer. Uh, but I'm sure a lot more research goes into any potential transfers than just what they've done on this tournament stage. But this player um, lit up the tournament last night, had an incredibly positive game really really great performance and we're going to talk about him and we're going to talk about whether or not he is on Arsenal's radar but first of all let's get into our first point let's talk England so as I say I got a lot of stick for kind of obviously I did call out Declan Rice's performance but I got a lot of stick for supposedly in a lot of people's eyes scapegoating Trent Alexander-Arnold which I think is a nonsense I've said it once, and I'll say it again, I think for me, he is up there among the most talented in this group. The problem is, is that he's not a central midfield player. And what you're doing is you're asking a fullback to change his habits, um, to not drift into the areas that he normally drifts into. And if he does, that leaves Declan Rice a little bit exposed and a little bit isolated. Um, and, and you're asking somebody to change their habits. And it's not easy to do that when you've played all your career in one particular position. Put aside the, the Declan Rice chat, the Trent Alexander-Arnold chat, the Phil Foden stuff, the Harry Kane stuff that we've seen sort of come to uh, the fore in terms of the conversation over the last 24 hours. And just look at how negative England are generally. And there, for me, is your bigger problem. I saw this floating around on social media earlier today. And the minute I saw it, I knew I had to include it in the episode. If you are listening to this on audio, I will do my absolute best to explain this to you. But what it is, is it's a, it's a map that identifies and highlights England's average positions on the pitch when leading against Denmark. This is the 15 minute period when England took the lead or after England took the lead before conceding. And this is a Sky Sports graphic, right? So it's pretty credible. What you will see is you will see 10, sorry, I beg your pardon, nine of the 10 outfield players spread across the edge of the penalty area with one player, Bukayo Saka, in a slightly more advanced position, but he's halfway between the penalty area and the halfway line. So England completely sunk after they scored the goal. England were pinned back by the Danes. They didn't have a clue how to get out. 
they couldn't work the ball um, through the lines well enough. And I know that we've talked about Declan Rice maybe not being great at that in the past, but he's not the only one responsible. Obviously, centre-halves can break lines, full-backs can break lines. Um, and they couldn't go long and direct over the top. They couldn't drop a ball over for a runner to chase because there were no runners. A, everybody was so deep, but B, they didn't really have that type of player up there. They certainly don't have that in their centre forward, Harry Kane, who on this map was playing like a bloody left back. It's mad. So the point I'm trying to make, and, and I'm going to wrap up on this very, very quickly, is you can talk about individuals and you can talk about a, a potential player being put into a, a position that doesn't really work for him and the nullification, if you like, of his skill set because he's playing out of position. It very much feels like Gareth Southgate's just trying to get what he believes are the best players on the pitch and thinks that that's just going to magically work. And that isn't how football works, is it? And yeah, I just wanted to highlight that we can sit here and we can argue about this player and that player and he should play and he shouldn't play and whatever. But a coach at this level has to be able to implement some strategy. Now, I'm not saying the strategy is going to be as complex as what you would see at club level where you have those players every single day and at your disposal so that you can do things the way that you want to do them and, you know, really go in on the details. But a good coach knows that that is unacceptable, that you need to squeeze the team up, that you need to have an outlet. England didn't have an outlet and they sunk into a really low block at this point. And it's no wonder that Denmark, in the end, found an equalising goal and probably created the better chances to win the game in the end. And that's that's where England are at. But I thought that was fascinating to see because people keep saying, and, and I know that Gareth Southgate was asked after the game, are you telling your team to drop off after they score a goal? And Gareth Southgate was adamant that, no, that's not what he's telling them. Well, if you're not instructing them to do that, then why aren't you on the sidelines with your coaching staff actively trying to get them to push up and squeeze up? And I think for England fans that are really frustrated by this, if they could see that Gareth Southgate was visibly on the sidelines trying to get them to squeeze up, trying to get them up the pitch, then I think people would go, you know what, actually, it's probably not a directive that's coming from Gareth. Actually, this is just the players kind of going back into their shells, maybe the weight of expectation and the pressure that they're under to perform when wearing the three lines on their chest is too much for them. I don't know. But if they could see that Gareth was actively trying to change that in game, maybe they'd be a little bit um, less critical of him. But, you know, yeah, he says, no, that's not what I told them to do. But he doesn't do it with any real conviction. He doesn't do it with any real um, sort of sting, if you like. And I guess that is Gareth Southgate's character, but it works against him in situations like this. But it was a really poor performance. You can go on about the individuals, but this is really damning to me. Um, the fact that England were pinned back the way they were by a Danish side that aren't that great, in my opinion. And, you know, yeah, we talk about teams maybe sometimes starting tournaments slow and building into them and warming up to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And maybe we will see that over the course of the tournament because, let's face it, can England actually be any worse than they've been so far? But when they come up against the very best, if they end up in a situation like this, they are going to be torn a new one. And that is not acceptable when you think about the talent that they have within the group. But anyway, that's enough on England. Let's turn our attentions to the mighty Arsenal. OK, uh, the next story concerns Mario Cozier Dubery, who is set to leave Arsenal at the end of June when his contract expires. It's been reported elsewhere that he has informed the club over the last 24 hours that that is his intention. Uh, the lack of a first-team pathway, as far as he can see it, is uh, the reason the club recognise uh, the increased level uh, of performance makes it harder for academy players. Um, but Art de Roche uh, says that he feels he could have made it in time. There is interest from Europe. There is interest from the Premier League, and there's also interest from some clubs in the Championship as well. I don't think he'll have a shortage of suitors. I've said it to you guys before that when I've watched the academy teams, when I've had the pleasure of commentating on them or covering their games over the course of the last couple of seasons, Amario Cozier Dubery is one of a very select few that I believe can make it, can take it to the next level. 
His style of play reminds me a lot of that of Bukayo Saka's. And I guess he's probably looking at Bukayo Saka and thinking, well, I ain't getting in on that right-hand side anytime soon. And I don't really want to be second fiddle anywhere. I believe in my talent. I back my talent. And you know what? Credit to him because sometimes we look at players and we say, you left too early and then you've gone somewhere and it's turned out to be even worse and the pathway is even more difficult and what on earth are you bloody doing? But sometimes you have to tip your hat to these guys and say they back themselves. Um, they believe that there's a better pathway for them out there, you know, maybe at another club. That's just how football goes. And I'm fine with it. So I wish Amario Cozia Dubri all the best. I think he is one of the best of that group. But can I hand on heart say that he's ready to play in the first team today? Based on what I've seen, I can't. Um, but I don't think that's a, a slight on him in any way, shape or form. We're talking about Arsenal the second best team in the country right now and one of the best teams in Europe. So, you know, for someone still making his way, it's understandable that he might need to go elsewhere to get his football in. But wish him all the best. And of course, uh, we'll see what happens with that. But it looks like his mind is made up. And he'll be leaving the club at the end of June. That brings me on nicely, actually, uh, to a question um, that I was uh, that I was asked by somebody on X just before uh, pressing the record button on this episode. Uh, it came from Yata21, who said, Hey, Harry, with the news that another academy player is off, can we see any route into the first team without ripping up the model and starting again? I've said it over and over again. Like I, I think the gap between academy football and first team football is huge, particularly at a club like Arsenal. And I think where you are one of the more resourced clubs, you are probably going to want to go out and bring in players that you know can do the job straight away rather than, you know, being desperate for it to be academy players or being forced into a position where you have to turn to them. I think if they're good enough, they'll get the chances. And I do think, for example, Ethan Waneri will probably be in the first team set up come next season. But, you know, it's just the way the game's gone. I think academies, when you're at the very elite level, uh, you know, are just are there obviously to produce you a, a conveyor belt of players, of course. And if that works out, great. But I think they're also there and need to be utilized as, as money-making machines as well. So like in this instance, we're a little bit screwed, right? Because Amario Cozio Dubri's contract runs out so he can do what he likes. But in the situation where a player is under contract, you can get compensation. When you get to the point when they're 17 and you can offer them a professional contract, you can then start loaning them out. And if they go away and they impress, you can sell them for a fee and you can start generating money that can then be spent on the first team or wherever else you want to spend it. Um, and that academy is doing you a service in that sense. But it's very difficult to make that jump. And I think, as I say, Ethan Wanneri is the one that I look at and think could potentially do it. But it's no slight on any of the others because it's just such a big jump to make. And when the team's performing and when the team's going in the right direction like it is, the likelihood of Mikel Arteta having to turn to one of these guys or wanting to prioritise one of these guys over someone that he spent tens of millions for um, while assembling this squad is very unlikely. So, yeah, um, wish him all the best. On to our main story of the day. According to The Athletic, Arsenal have the athletic Bill Bowwinger, Nico Williams, on their wish list. Mikel Arteta sees him as one of his preferred options if Arsenal decide to go for a wide player this summer. Now, we talked about Nico Williams briefly on an episode that we did a few days ago. And I think if you listened to that, you would have probably come away from it believing that I wasn't totally convinced that Nico Williams is the one. And look, my mind is not going to completely change off the back of one performance. But my God, he was bloody impressive for Spain last night. Watched him in full, um, thought that he was incredibly effective in the dribble, energetic, always looking to get involved, a real direct winger. Basically, the opposite of what you'd think of when you think of a Spanish wide player. You know, the directness, the pace, the tempo with which he plays the game. The fact that he's happy to take you on on the outside and get to the byline rather than always looking to cut inside and play something a little bit more intricate. That's why he stands out, or partly why he stands out in this team. Him and Lamine Yamal have been superb at this tournament so far. Um, both young players, both, um, you know, really impressive for Spain at the moment. And they have the experienced Alvaro Morata leading the line in between them, who also 
he's happy to drop deep and create those channels for those two guys to run into. And I think he's been a real breath of fresh air at this tournament. And if he keeps performing like that, then perhaps I will be come the end of the summer or come a little bit later on in the summer, a lot more convinced that he can do the job for us. I just wanted to look at his performance from yesterday. Um, he was taken off on 78 minutes and replaced by Iosi Perez. But you look at his um, sort of heat map here and you can see that he's very, very much um, maintaining the width for that Spanish side, which is good. If you look at his uh, shot map, he had a couple of efforts at goal. Uh, one from close range that he put um, to the right of the goal high and wide. He really ought to have done better there. And then he had one from the edge of the box on 70 minutes that came crashing back off the crossbar. Desperately unlucky um, not to score a goal last night. Um, minutes played 78 on the night. His XG was 0.37. Expected assist was 0.41. Um, 10 dribble attempts. Only four of them were successful. And I guess you could make the case that actually that's not that great. And I'd understand where you're coming from. But I think when you're looking at a young player, when you're looking at someone that's still making their way, and I think we can all agree, and I think I made this point on the, the recent episode that I referenced, that he's still a little bit raw. But the fact that he's willing to get on the ball and take these people on, I think is great. What he has above some of the other wingers, some of his other peers that are maybe just as unpredictable, I guess, when it comes to how successful they'll be on the dribble, is that he's an incredibly sort of accurate passer of the ball. He doesn't waste the ball a lot. You know, yeah, he does take on people at times and sometimes he'll lose the ball, but his passing accuracy for someone in the final third that's always looking to either make that killer pass um, or, or, you know, will go on a dribble and try and make something happen himself. To have a 93% pass succession rate, um, I think is really good. Four key passes in the game, five crosses, three that were able to pick out teammates. Uh, ground duels, uh, he was involved in 19, won five um, and won 50% of his aerial duels. Did lose possession a fair few times, 19 times to be exact over the course of the game. But as I say, I always remember that. And the reason I always look at these stats a little bit differently, maybe to other people, is I always remember people used to make that case about Alexis Sanchez. They used to look at him and say, Alexis Sanchez lost the ball 15 times today. Not acceptable. And I used to think, are you for real? Alexis Sanchez is the difference maker. Alexis Sanchez tries shit that nobody else would try. Alexis Sanchez is more often than not the match winner because of that very reason. So I'm always wary of looking at how much someone loses the ball when they're playing in that position. And their job essentially is to make the difference. If you're playing in the center of midfield and you're giving the ball away 19 times, then we've got a problem. If you're playing at center back and you're giving the ball away 19 times, then we've got a problem. I'm not. I'm still not totally convinced by Nico Williams, and I will be keeping a much closer eye on him as the tournament goes on. But interesting that he is someone that's on Arsenal's radar. We've heard that before as well, so it's not something that's come out of the blue just off the back of this performance. But is it a deal that Arsenal will do over the summer? We know he's got a, a very reasonable release clause of around about 50-odd million. Um, could we see Arsenal potentially try and trigger that, make that deal happen? Um I'm not sure. In fact, let me just double check on that release clause. Hold on. Nico Williams' new release clause, because I don't want to give you the wrong information. Uh, according to uh, The Athletic, 55 million euros, which is about 47 million pounds. Very, very reasonable amount of money. If if he does end up leaving, Athle or sorry, if he does continue to perform to this level over what remains of this tournament, I'll be very surprised if he's an Athletic Bilbao player come the start of the new season. Obviously, he has to agree to a move as well. But that clause is very achievable, very reasonable. And I think there'll be a fair few suitors in for Nico Williams. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the pod. It was a brief one, but the Euros are in full swing at the moment. And that has taken over, hasn't it? That's what we're all watching. That's what we're all focused on. There are still some Arsenal stories floating around, which we will keep you across, of course. Um, but until the next one, take care of yourselves. Enjoy the football tonight. Netherlands, France, cracking game that. Looking forward to sitting down with my barbecue and, uh, and watching that one. I'll catch you on the next episode. Until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Goodbye.